Wave one of the internet, in case you don't know this, do this quick, quick, and I'll have a whole bunch of stuff wrong. Correct me if I oversimplify. ARPANET, federal government in the United States with research partners internationally said, we have a lot of data, let's share it. So they created a network with the expectation of being a limited number of people who they could attest and authenticate and trust with shared data. And then some folks said, well, maybe we can do more with this. So we created essentially the World Wide Web on top of it, which was a user interface. And we don't know who the hell hopped on the net. And then somewhere between 2.0 and 3.0, we said, let's make it wireless and let's put it in our pockets. And as we did this, you saw the applications of the use case scenarios for networking or internetworking change. Now we've arrived at today, where there's a merger between the story I just told you and another story called embedded. Does anyone here know what embedded technology is, more or less? Yeah, this is, but this is why it's so freaky, because only two people in the room. Embedded technology is computing, control, and communications inside your refrigerators inside your cars, inside medical imaging equipment. All the stuff that's on a factory floor, not all of it, most of it, is generally considered embedded technology. It has different performance requirements. It has different financial requirements. It has different, it's just a different market. Embedded technology is a very different market from information technology. And here's what's happening. The mobile web with all that wireless is starting to merge with embedded technologies. Embedded is about real time, mission critical, low profile, small footprint, and persistent deployment, five years, seven years, 10 years, 12. And those two worlds are merging in something called the Internet of Things, where we can take very small sensors, controllers, or communications devices, and we put them inside a physical object that we care about, or we put it next to that physical object we care about. So think about assets, think about inventories that are consumed in a transaction, and then think about areas of operation. So a simple one is, imagine you are building a road and you put sensors in or around where you're going to build the road so you can get moisture and temperature and maybe get some um, seismic readings, maybe get some wind direction and such, just so that the people who are engineering the site or working on the site can know in real time what's happening environmentally around them. Because satellite weather may not be enough and local weather station may not be enough, so you put sensors in that area of operation. Make sense? And then you start putting equipment in that area of operation. That's an asset, a bulldozer, a crane, a dump truck. Where is it? What is it? And there's something called HUMS, Health and Utilization Monitoring Status. Not only what dump truck is it, but where is it, but more than that, give me the health and utilization monitoring status of that dump truck. Fuel, oil, temperature, all kinds of other stuff. The killer app for that is called Hours of Service because most of the equipment that's on that site building that road is actually rented and you pay for it based on hours of use. And if you don't know, if you don't know that somebody turned the ignition on on your bulldozer, what are you doing? You're trusting that when they send you the time card that's ink or pencil on paper, that they did in fact start it at 7 a.m. But when you instrument that bulldozer, what have you found out? They typically started it up at 6.45, so it idled for 15 minutes, and you paid for that oil and that gas and the general wear and tear on the bulldozer, and, 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 an asset. Now an inventory might be some pallets or crates or some big steel tubing, or maybe there's some other very high value inventory on the job site, maybe that galvanized steel rail. You might put a little sensor on that. Why? So you can know what you've got, where it is, its state, status, or condition. Why? That intelligence gives you the ability to make better decisions. It's called ground truth. Those of you that are in the scientific community know that you can do a test in the lab, but then someone's going to say, well, do you have ground truth? Did you go out in the real world? The Internet of Things gives us ground truth on the physical assets, inventories, and areas of operation that matter to us so that when we make decisions, build, tear down, buy, sell, preserve, develop, we'll have more data. We'll have more ground truth. We'll have a better decision support tool. We are making decisions about what to do with our valuable time, in many cases based on piss poor data. And when we talk about things like water security and food security and environmental security and transportation security and energy security, in a lot of cases, we're making guesses. We've got reams and reams and reams and reams of data, absolutely no doubt. But in some cases, we still don't have ground truth. You're going to want to have more trust 
And that's another way I describe the Internet of Things or the instrumentation of the physical world, because if it's done right, it can be an engine of trust. You can get enough data that you can trust your expectations behind the water performance of that house, your expectations behind the hours of service log that you receive from the people that you rented your equipment to is going to be accurate. In other words, you have more data about the physical world. Because every day I'm out in the world doing the work I do, I'm meeting more and more people, including more and more people with sources of capital, specifically subject matter experts in the spaces we're operating, who are all saying what I'm saying, but are more expert at it and are further ahead. Because the people I hang out with, and there are thousands of them, um, are wanting to make money driving these changes. They're not doing it in the spirit of sort of social entrepreneurism. Uh, they're absolutely looking to make money on it, but they're also absolutely looking at it saying, this, this makes no sense, the way that we've constructed some of our systems. They're just looking at them and saying, this just doesn't make any sense anymore. We're at the point of unsustainability. They want to be part of that change. And not from, uh, again, not from a soft and fuzzy place, but from a hard-nosed, you know, bloodthirsty, marrow-sucking, shark-type approach. It's going to change. I want to be on the right side of the change. And that's something that's a little different. This isn't about social entrepreneurism. This is about making money by making the change that gets people to a place where there's a lot more health and wellness and a lot more stability that gets distributed intentionally, not through taxation and not through policy and certainly not through the public sector. I think the, the rules that we're living with now, whether you love them or hate them or you have sort of a mixed perception of them the way I do, this is all so new. You can do whatever the hell you want if you can prove value to your customer and you can prove return to your shareholders. You don't have to go in with advertising revenue as a profit center. You don't have to go in with a freemium version of this thing. You don't have to go to the low-cost provider overseas. You just, everything is open to question. And I think a lot of your peers are doing it. We're finding some of them. They're finding some of us. And I think they're the ones that are going to end up winning. But here's the key. You may not know it because the difference between them and their customers and partners won't be so great because what's driving them is the success of the people they work with, as much or more than their own individual success. Man, I probably came off like 30% too preachy, but I'm trying. Great, so we want to thank I'm Chris here. and uh, thank you. Thank everyone for joining. <coughs>